Good morning. My name is Joe Starita. I'm coming to you live from the campus of the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I thought, uh, per your instructor's request, that I would uh, uh, talk a little bit about a book that I obviously care a lot about. And uh, I'm very thrilled to hear that you have just finished reading. So first of all, I don't think authors are anywhere near as uh, respectful and as thankful to their readers as they should be. So I don't want to make that mistake. And I'm not going to make it by telling you right off the bat uh, I really appreciate the fact that you have uh, carved out a niche of time in your insanely busy 24-7 YouTube, um, Facebook, Twitter worlds to call a time out and read this book. Um, because if you spend two and a half years on a project that you really passionately care about, um, and it doesn't connect with anybody, then uh, you have to really question whether or not that was a good use of your time. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's groups like you and it's teachers like you have who make the decision to try and inject this unknown slice of American history and just this great American story uh, into the curriculum, into your lives, that I feel really appreciative. So thank you very much. Uh, for, for uh, assigning the book, and thank you very much for reading the book. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about why uh, this became my Moby Dick uh, for two and a half years, and why I would routinely get up at three o'clock in the morning on these bone-chilling nights with six inches of snow on the ground to go over this paragraph that I had written 12 hours earlier that I knew the cadence and the rhythm uh, of this paragraph was off like an eighth of an octave and I would lay there in bed at three o'clock in the morning I would just kind of grind my teeth knowing that it wasn't quite hitting the note that I wanted that it was sounding more like Roseanne Barr and I wanted to sound like Luciano Pavarotti so up I get coffee pot goes on click the computer on and I would sit there until I got that paragraph right, until it was much more uh, tilted towards Luciano Pavarotti than uh, the good uh, Miss uh, Roseanne Barr. But there are three fundamental reasons why I really love this story. Um, and one of the things that you have to do when you're writing a book, I've been a newspaper person uh, for 25 years of my life, so at this point, I've written hundreds and hundreds of newspaper articles. And if I may use a track analogy, writing a newspaper article is like running the 100-meter dash. Writing a magazine article, which I've written dozens of, is a little bit like running the mile. But writing a book is like running the marathon. And you have to train for it, just like you would the marathon. You have to get regular hours of sleep. You have to eat right. You have to work out because you are, in effect, training for the equivalent of a literary marathon. And one of the things you have to do to stack the deck in your favor, to stack the deck in your favor when you're setting off on this 26.7-mile uh, run, is you have to look across the landscape of material, and you have to very vigorously decide when you do that whether or not this story that you are going to commit to two and a half, three years of your life to, whether or not it has a constellation of universal themes that will connect with readers. And so I did this very carefully and very methodically after I had done about uh, six months of research looking for where are the themes in this story that if this book were translated into Turkish or Swedish or Spanish, would people in Buenos Aires, would people in Buenos Aires or Sweden um, or Turkey, would they be able to understand this story even though they know very little about American Indians? And uh, I'm very, I was very blessed and very fortunate that when I began this search for universal themes um, that I found a story that was chock-a-block with universal themes. You strip a lot of this away and you get it down just to the themes. This is, at its heart, a story about love of family, about love of country, about freedom, about spirituality, about perseverance, honor, courage, and fortitude. Those are enough universal themes for anybody. 
for anybody. So I was much fortified uh, when I really analyzed what these themes uh, bring to the table and how universal these themes are. Uh, a very specific example, and one of the things I always like to do as both a lecturer and as a writer is to go from the general to the specific, from the universal to the specific. So if I say this is a story that is chock-a-block with universal themes and I lay them out, okay, then the next thing you need to do is back that up with a specific example. And a specific example in this book would be the story of White Buffalo Girl. The story of this tiny girl and her family being forcibly removed from their home at Bayonet Point, having had water and food withheld from them, their spirits broken, and forced to walk uh, 600 miles across the better part of uh, two and a half states to go to this place that they had never heard of, they knew nothing about, and on the second, third day of the journey in this harsh weather, this baby girl dies. She dies in this village, Neely, Nebraska, of white settlers. And if you've read the book, and you have, then you know the story. You know that this community of white settlers understood what the Indian father and the Indian mother were going through, and they embraced this child as though it were one of their own. And they have looked over this grave every year as they promised Black Elk they would in the spring of 1877. They've looked after this grave every year for the last 136 years. For the last 136 years. And mothers still, 136 years later, they bring their daughters from all over northeast Nebraska on Mother's Day to this grave overlooking the river in this beautiful cemetery in Neely, Nebraska, and they tell their 8, 10, 11-year-old daughters the story of White Buffalo Girl and how the citizens and the community and the white settlers of Neely, Nebraska adopted and embraced and nurtured and cared for the memory of this girl. That's, a, a, that's something that anybody can understand. Any mother in Turkey, any mother in Buenos Aires, any mother in Sweden can read that and understand what the mother and father were going through. So that's one of the reasons I really love this story is it has this great narrative sense of power that comes from storytelling power, that comes from these universal themes that we all can identify with, no matter what our national and religious and ethnic background. A second reason that I would typically get up at 3 o'clock in the morning because I was so obsessed about this uh, story is because it has so many white heroes in it. Now that seems like an odd thing to say, but if you were to take the entire 19th century 19th century America, and you would spread out the entire 1800s on a historical cultural continuum, and you were to analyze that intersection where the forces of manifest destiny collided head on with the forces of the indigenous people, and you would find in almost every single instance uh, at that intersection, it was the indigenous people who always took a beating. And what you find in the Standing Bear story is just the opposite. You find by the spring of 1879 that all of these white people were coming out of the woodwork at all of these different strata and levels of American society in a way they never had before. And they were coming out of the nooks and crannies in the different strata of American society, and they were rallying around the flag of this middle-aged chief of an obscure tribe in a remote corner of the central Great Plains. Never happened before, never happened before. You had the most powerful religious force in Nebraska, Bishop Clarkson, furious over how this man and his 29 followers who uh, had limped in half starved and half dead to Fort Omaha, how they were being treated. And he was pounding telegram after telegram to the bureaucrats in Washington demanding to know, as a religious leader in eastern Nebraska, how on the one hand they were supposed to Christianize these people, and on the other hand treat them uh, in the most unchristian of ways. And he wanted answers. So he came out and started rallying around that flag. You had 
the most powerful lawyer in the state of Nebraska. Of course, he would be named Andrew Jackson Poppleton, the first lawyer admitted to the Nebraska Bar, former mayor of Omaha, ironically, the general counsel for the Union Pacific Railroad in the spring of 1879, an institution that probably did more to destroy native culture than any other institution in America in the 19th century. But Andrew Jackson Poppleton was intrigued by this story, and he too came out of the woodwork, so intrigued by and fascinated that he agreed to reach Standing Bear for free, pro bono. Um, the newspaper man, this crusading, larger-than-life, sometimes megalomaniac, but heart in the right place, newspaper man, Thomas Henry Tibbles. He comes out of the woodwork, and he starts pounding away story after story after story, putting in print, using his newspaper as a uh, textual bullhorn to rally sentiment and rally information and rally the troops around the miscarriage of justice that he saw occurring here. And those stories started out in Omaha, and then they jumped across the Mississippi, and they got to Chicago and Baltimore and Washington and Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and New York. And pretty soon, there was a substantial band of American citizens who were outraged at how the government was treating a man who simply wanted to bury his son. And so they began doing what citizens do in a democracy. They began contacting their, their congressmen and their senators to the point where they began congressional inquiries. The Jewish community in Omaha in the spring of 1879 stepped out of the shadows, stepped out of the back alley, stepped out of the woodwork, and they began hitting up white people for money to use as a defense fund for an American Indian. Do you think that was a routine event in the 19th century? No, no, it only happened once. That was in Omaha in May of 1879, in this case involving Chief Standing Bear versus Brigadier General George Crook. So you have this really incredible group of people that um, are responding to the right information. Like Abraham Lincoln famously said, if you give people the right information, 90% of the time they will do the right thing. And so this was a textbook case of this happening in the case of, of Steve, uh, Chief Standing Bear. Uh, the third and final reason that I just briefly want to mention uh, and talk about why I love this story and why I think it's important and why I was obsessed by it is on a different level. It's on a metaphorical level. The first two reasons I gave you, the, the, um, uh, the glut of universal themes and the number of different kinds of white people that stepped up to the plate and went to bat for Standing Bear. I can literally prove that those are true. Those are true. I have documents in my files in my office that substantiate those are true. The third and final reason I want to mention uh, about this book is, is, is not something I can prove by pulling out a file in my file cabinet. Uh, because it's more uh, a metaphorical observation and a metaphorical truth. And what I believe to be the case is that the two days that Standing Bear sent uh, on the witness stand on the second floor of this monolithic limestone federal courthouse on the corner of 15th and Dodge Streets on May 1st and 2nd, 1879, where he was relentlessly and ruthlessly grilled by this brash young federal prosecutor by the name of Gino Lambertson, who was trying his first case, as you know, because you read the book. And he was in Standing Bear's face, and he was relentlessly asking, well, who are you, and what does it mean to be a chief, and who are your people? And what do you believe in? And what do you believe in? Uh, question after question that was answered patiently by the Omaha Indian poet Bright Eyes, as you know. Um, but what I'm going to argue, as a reason that I also love this story so much, on a metaphorical plane, is by the time this year had run its course, by the time Standing Bear had triumphed in federal court in Omaha and given his last speech and his last appearance in late December in New York City, by the time that whole year ended, what Standing Bear had metaphorically done, in my opinion, was to hold up a mirror 
to the United States. And he was putting them on the witness stand. And he was assuming the role of Jeannie Lambertson as prosecutor. And he was asking America in the summer and fall of 1879, no, not who am I, but who are you? Who are you? And what does it mean to be an American? And what is this thing you have called democracy? And who is your God? And what does it mean to be a Christian? And is this the behavior of Christians? These are some questions I have, and these are some answers that I would like to hear from you. And so I think in the end, by the time this case ran its course and Standing Bear triumphed in a federal courtroom for the first time in the history of Native America and became, in the eyes of many Native Americans, the Martin Luther King of Native Americans, I think by the time this had run its course, that Standing Bear had done something that is very, very difficult to do. And that is, he enabled Americans to be better than they thought they could be. He um, enabled and allowed Americans to jump over a social justice bar that they had thought was too high to clear. But he inspired them to jump over that social justice bar in a way that they had never envisioned before he came onto the scene. And so, for those three reasons, and others, but for those three reasons for, for now, those are reasons that really underscore my love affair with this story and why I could get up at 3 o'clock in the morning as many times as I did to try and do this man justice and try and do his story justice. So again, I thank you very much for reading this book. Your instructor has indicated that she was going to send me some of your comments, and I really love hearing back from readers. I am always fascinated by how they interpret things and what their reactions are. So um, I look forward to hearing your comments. I thank you again for indulging uh, your valuable time in reading this book. And I hope that you take away something from this story and something from this book that can in some way do to you what it did to many, many thousands of Americans in 1879. And that is to inspire you to be a little bit better than you thought you could be. To jump higher over that social justice bar than you thought you could be. And if, if, if you can do that, then that's really what this story has to teach us. That's what this story, that's the takeaway for this story. So again, thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to your comments. So long.